Hello everyone, I'm Ron Barrick. This presentation is about how you say, buy my book, without actually having to say it. That's what you want to happen, but it has to be your potential reader's idea, not yours. If you say it, it's calculated to fail. If your potential reader says it, you're golden. Well, at least you have a chance. We all know writing a great novel is just the beginning. What follows is much more difficult, and unless you're a masochist or a natural born salesperson, it's also quite painful and challenging. That next part, after you've written, edited, and published your novel, is promoting and marketing it. And if you know the difference between promoting and marketing, please send me an email and explain it to me. Well, Regardless of the choice of words, it all boils down to selling. And I, for one, hate selling. But I'm not Lee Child or Bob Dugoni. And if I don't do that selling, no one's going to do it for me. And unless I'm John Land, it doesn't come naturally. So how do we do it? Well, there's the tried and true way, the boring stuff. Write a blog, post something on social media, spend money on ads. They're all boring and they really don't work all that well, unless you're so branded that you don't really need to do it in the first place. We're not going to talk about that boring stuff on this panel. There are countless how-to books and experts who will tell you how strategically to say, buy my book. Today, we're going to talk about something a lot more fun, a lot more creative, and a lot more effective at getting people to, wait for it, buy your book, and without you ever having to utter those obnoxious words. How you ask? You did ask, didn't you? Make a video. Not a conventional trailer that says, buy my book, but one that tells a story hopefully a clever one with a good hook and a bit of humor to boot. Write a script for your video. That's what you do next. You can do that. You're a writer. And while you're at it, be a bit of a ham and get out in front of the camera as well. Readers like to see who they're reading. Just ask Liv Constantine and all of the Zoom events they're running right now to promote their latest book, The Wife Stalker. Believe me, what we're going to show you today is a lot easier and more fun than saying, buy my book. And once you're on board, all you then have to do is hire yourself a couple of really talented people, like the two who have joined me on this panel, Martin Varro and Clem Darling. Say hello guys, because otherwise the viewers will think I'm trying to monopolize this conversation. Hi everyone. Hi, hello. <laughs> okay, let me first tell- Hey Ron, when do Clem and I get to say something in this? Patience Martin, it's coming. Let me first tell our viewers who you guys are and why you both are as great as you each are. Martin is the unbelievably talented producer. He makes sure all things video work from the lighting to the cameras, to the recording processes, and to the editing. Martin actually made me look not half bad, and that wasn't easy. Clem is the real actor in this video. We interviewed 20 candidates to play the serial killer in what you will see shortly. The other 19 looked like actors pretending to be killers. Clem didn't look like he was pretending. He looked like the real deal. That was key. You don't want to meet Clem in a dark alley. If Clem had told me to stop talking rather than Martin, I would have stopped on a dime. Ron, stop talking. Yes, Clem. Okay, Martin, what can you tell us about making a 10 or 15 minute video to post on your YouTube channel? 
By the way, everyone, if you're going to do this, you need a YouTube channel if you don't already have one. But they're easy to create and they're free. And they're easy for viewers to access. For mine, as an example, just go to youtube.com forward slash Ronald S. Barrick. Okay, so I'll be brief because I know Ron's gonna start talking again any, any second now. But uh, making a video like the one we're gonna show you in a moment is really quite manageable and it's really quite affordable. Well, from the standpoint of one who counts all of his pennies, I can tell you the likes of Martin and Clem cost a lot less than hiring expensive publicists and running lots of ads. Hey Ron, it's still my turn. Sorry Martin, your turn, but make it quick. We're on the clock here. Okay, so first um, I have to get Ron to stop asking question after question after question and just come up with a script already. But once he gave me the script, I put out a call for actors and uh, from there we received about 20 one minute uh, recorded auditions. And at that point, uh, Ron, his wife, Barbie, and I then went through all of them. And uh, we all agreed on Clem hands down after seeing all the tapes. And from that point, we set a date and location for the shoot. Um, and we actually decided to shoot indoors so that we didn't have to deal with um, any expensive permits or any um, large expenses like that that we didn't necessarily need on such a small budget. But um, at that point, we showed up at the appointed time, set up all our equipment, and shot our scenes. Uh, in this case, we divided the video you're about to see into eight different episodes. Um, Clem was a natural at playing Charlie, the serial killer, and, well, Ron, not so much, but uh, he did improve with every take. Um, we had lots of takes, but we got them uh, shot in the better part of a day, uh, just about. Um, at that point, we edited all the takes and came up with the final result. Ron approved it, and at that point, we uploaded it to his YouTube channel. As you'll see in a moment, Clem was another one of our key ingredients. He showed up like the consummate pro he is, ready to go. How did this project work for you, Clem? Well, I can't say it was like any typical acting gig, but it was very enjoyable. The script was key, as it always is, and this one was really logical and entertaining, which made it really easy to learn the lines. And as you'll see, the day went on and we grew into our parts. It was actually a lot of fun, just like this reunion is. Ron says he wouldn't want to meet me in a dark alley, but he's the one I wouldn't want to meet in a dark alley. He might talk you to death. Ah, uh, and there you have it. The result was the video series you will now get to watch in just a moment. It's titled Writing a Murderer. We came up with the title because we wanted to draw in the millions of cult followers of the documentary Making a Murderer that you can find on Netflix. Did it work? We ran some strategic Google ads and we watched our video series take off more than a quarter of a million views in less than two months. How was it used to sell copies of my latest Brooks Latello thriller novel, Payback? Just wait for the image of Payback at the end of the video series and you'll see. We didn't say buy my book, but a lot of viewers got the message on their own that someone who could create a clever video production might also be able to write an engaging novel, one worth giving a try. You can now stay tuned right here and watch Writing a Murderer. Do you have a video in you? You won't know till you try. Good luck.
Serial killers. The definition of a serial killer is one who has killed on at least three separate and unrelated occasions and plans to kill again. It's rumored that there are at least 3,000 serial killers running around loose in the United States today. My name is Ron Barrick, Dr. Ron Barrick. I'm doing a study on serial killers. As part of that, I am recording a number of interviews with actual serial killers. Those interviews, as recorded, will be appended to my treatise. Today, we will begin with the first of my subjects. He is appearing here voluntarily, but we've changed his name to Charlie in order to help preserve his anonymity. In order to encourage Charlie to begin speaking, I asked him to tell us what caused him to first fixate on killing people. As you'll see, it took Charlie very little to be willing to talk about himself. So, Charlie, where would you like to start? I remember the first time I had the urge to kill someone. Not just anyone, mind you. I'm not capricious or uncouth. I'm just me. To be sure, my deadly urges weren't the first of my social anomalies. They were no doubt a natural and foreseeable evolution of my earlier irregularities. Charlie interview part two. Please continue, Charlie. I realized before I was getting ahead of myself, something I often do. Digressing, you might say. Allow me to rewind and start at the beginning, at least as I see it. <laughs> rewind, I like that word. Because at the end of the day, that's what we're talking about, right? How I'm wound. I might be dark and stormy, but that doesn't mean the night was. I've probably always been the way I am. I just didn't know it. I thought it was them. Until it finally dawned on me that I was the one who was different. Who are them, you ask? Them is everyone else. Everyone other than me. To be sure, that includes you. Me? I don't know what I have to do with this. I don't know how you would feel, but I don't like the direction this interview is taking. Seeming to turn from Charlie's historical victims to me. Charlie interview, part three. Can you please tell us some more, Charlie? Sure. It was me, Doc. To make things better, to fix things, I had to change me. I had to change the way I was wired, the way I was wound, don't you see? But how you ask? It's okay you ask, because I ask too. So I did some research, I read some books, Actually, I read a lot of books, and what I learned was the one way to change, to fix myself, was by writing things down about me. Essentially, like keeping a diary so I could reflect on myself. And that made sense to me. Asked? I hadn't asked at all. Charlie sure seems to be on a roll and hell-bent on taking me along with him. Charlie interview, 
part four. Please continue, Charlie. The plan was originally to write about me. But if writing would help, why stop at writing about myself? I'm not that interesting. Writing about me was boring. So instead of dwelling on me, I decided I would write about others. I'd write about them. That way I could become like them. Like you, Barrick. But I didn't know that many people. Actually, I didn't know any people. At least, not that well. So I decided I would simply make them up in my mind. I would write fiction. I'd become a novelist. Like me? Why is Charlie becoming preoccupied with me? I didn't mean for that to happen. Not at all. Is that what psychiatrists refer to as transference? I always like rising up above the noise. But be careful what you wish for, they always say. They? Who are they? Charlie Interview, Part 5. You were saying, Charlie? So I began writing about others. Others I wanted to be like. Others I wanted to like me. I thought I was going to make a difference. In me. For me. Don't you see? A huge difference. But it didn't. Not at all. Why? I don't know. You'd have to ask them. But you'd better not dally. Dally? Not dally. This was supposed to be about how people like Charlie think, not what they do. This was supposed to calm Charlie down, not get him agitated. What have I started? How am I going to stop this? Charlie Interview, Part 6. Please continue, Charlie. I'm back. That made perfectly good sense to no one in particular, of course. Because there's no one here. Besides me. There's never anyone here besides me. Who, who are you talking to? It's just you and me. What do we have in this bag, as if I don't already know? One orange, one watermelon, three vials of insulin, and six disposable syringes. I, I, don't, I don't get it, Charlie. I, I don't see anything. What are these things you're describing? What are you planning to do with them? Charlie Interview, Part 7. Where are you, Charlie? Charlie? It was just amazing. The vial and the syringes didn't require a doctor's prescription. Just my fake driver's license. The pharmacist didn't seem even a little bit worried. Practice, practice, practice. What a busy little beaver I am. Practice makes perfect, don't you see? Charlie, what are you doing? Who, who are you talking to? You're out of control. You need to stop this right now. We need to get you some help. Charlie interview, part eight. I realize now what had started out as my project has somehow become Charlie's project. What are you doing, Charlie? What are you banging on? Business center, special delivery package. Mark Durgent. Oh my God, he's 
totally out of control. He's completely lost it. I've got to get help before he hurts himself or me.